Jay Buster. And... <laughs> <laughs> You're the backup plan. Good morning, and welcome to worship today. We're glad that you're in the Lord's house with us in person. I know many of you are still worshiping with us online via the web stream, and we ask God's blessings to be upon you all as well. As we move into this season of worship, I don't want to spend a lot of time with announcements. I know y'all get tired of me giving y'all all this information, but uh, this week is sort of a busy week. Monday, we have circle meetings in addition to Woman's Auxiliary, along with Board of Trustees, so please keep that in mind for tomorrow night. And then coming up on Wednesday, we have our adult Bible study time here in the sanctuary. And once again, that'll be streamed online. This week we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 21. We also have meetings for the middle school and high school youth on Wednesday evening along with chancel choir practice. One announcement I'd like to share on behalf of the Lambs Grove congregation. They have their rescheduled tent revival taking place this week. That will be this morning service, this evening service, right on through Friday. And if you would like to go to tonight's service, that will be at 6 p.m. and Monday through Friday 7 p.m. they have a different speaker and different special music each night and that will be taking place at 5533 Wiggins Mill Road. So again if you're able to support our sister church I know they would greatly appreciate that as they begin their revival time this week. I'm going to turn things over to Marcy for just a moment and I think that's all that I have. Okay, so this week is the week. Um, we really would like you to, if you have any other donations for the yard sale, to have them turned in by tomorrow. Um, we are busy trying to get everything prepared and priced and ready. Um, on Thursday evening, and forgive me because I do not have all of my ducks in a row and all my times with me, but Thursday evening we're going to give church members a early bird special um and so you can come in thursday evening and i'll have kelly send that out with all of his phone calls that he does during the week um and i'll post it on facebook um but you can come through thursday evening and you get a first opportunity before anyone else to shop and let me tell you it, it's a humongous humongous um yard sale bigger than growing. yes it's still growing and um things still yet to come um so it it's i don't even know if i would describe it as a yard sale it's Blue it's 
be. <laughs> Um, we might better list it as an estate sale or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> if things keep coming, we're going to have to open up the entire CEC. <laughs> um, but then it will be also is a Friday and a Saturday yard sale. Um, so both days. And it will be indoors and outdoors. Um, so we need at least nine people to help each day. So we especially need some men both mornings to help get the furniture out um, outside so that that will be the the drawing factor. Um, Most people want to see furniture and appliances and that sort of thing when they drive by. So if we can get some men to volunteer to be present on Friday and Saturday morning to help us with that, that would be appreciated. Um, So that is our main announcement. Also, don't forget that we do have raffle items, and the raffle tickets are still available, um, and they can be purchased in the conference room. What we have um, on display, some of our items still have not come in yet, but there is a calendar available in the conference room that has a listing of all the different items that um, one one name will be drawn each day this month for... um, for a for an for an item, and Miss K won a beautiful wreath. If you look in front of her, she won a beautiful wreath as one of the nice. items. And we still have many many um, beautiful items and special items uh, left to win. So be sure if you have not purchased tickets to purchase some. And if you have purchased some, you may want to purchase some more because the more times your name name is in the box, the more opportunities you have to win. And at this time. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. of call to worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Reverend D. Eakes, will you lead us in our invocation? Let us pray. Lord, for the richness of your grace, for your mercy and love, and your forgiveness, for all our sins, we give you praise. For this day that you have made, and all the joys that it gives to each of us, please receive our thanks, our praise, and may we feel your presence as we worship together this day to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our hymn of celebration is page 404, The Solid Rock.
Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are honoring our superheroes for the outstanding contributions they have made in our church and community. These superheroes have fiercely stepped up in using their superpowers during these difficult times we have faced in 2020. Not once did the fear of the unknown stop them from reaching out to this congregation and community. They have fought against evil and sin, and they have kept our church open and doing the Lord's work. The devil's dastardly plan has been foiled once again. Now, let's recognize each one. First, we have the amazing songbird, also known as Sally Davis, our music minister. (laughs) Her superpowers include musical talents, inspiration, and dedication. It's not hard to see the musical talent she demonstrates each week. Her talent for inspiring us during these uncertain times has been appreciated by many. The song selections each week have been just what we needed. Most of all, her superpower of dedication has been amazing. She has continued with choir practices on Wednesday nights every week and singing for all church services throughout this pandemic. No matter how few choir members show up, she always pulls us together and makes it work. Thank you, Songbird um, Sally, for all you do for Little Rock Church. Our next superhero is the fantastic Kids Crusader, also known as Marcy Rollins Smart, our youth and children's minister. <laughs> her super, her super, excuse me, her superpowers include sharing, generosity, and versatility. Marcy has fought to keep our youth on target, target with, the spiritual, with their spiritual growth. She has shared Sunday school materials and lessons online each week so the children can continue to have the lessons they would have had on Sunday, in Sunday school. Her generosity has been demonstrated with her desire to help families have adequate food each week. She organized teams of church members to shop, pack, and deliver food and other supplies to these families each week. Most of all, Marcy has been versatile in crusading for the needs of the youth by searching for ways to keep in touch with the youth in our church and community. Thank you, Kids Crusader, I mean Marcy, for all you have done for the youth of Little Rock Church and the community. Our last superhero is the mighty pastoral man, otherwise known as Kelly Smart, our senior pastor. His superpowers include endurance, leadership, and faith. Kelly has endured many obstacles in keeping the services available to our congregation as well as community, as the community. He has rearranged his schedule many times to accommodate recording Sunday services and Bible study. His leadership during this pandemic has been remarkable. Trying to hold a congregation together without coming face to face is not an easy task. But Kelly rose to the task and exceeded all expectations. His greatest superpower is his faith. Without it, he would not be able to do all the things he has done for our church. Thank you, pastoral man, oops, Kelly, for all you have done for us here at Little Rock Church. From 1 Thessalonians 5:12, we read, "And now, friends, we have you to honor those. We, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Thank you all for all you have done so very much. We love you, our superheroes. And if you have not given uh, a gift or anything yet, there is a place on the table in the conference room for um, a basket for cards and." and could put gifts for them. But thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> so can we can we now make copies of this and then autograph them for the, for the congregation, for those viewing online. 
That was going to be my very first question, so I'm glad that she gave us a copy of these. <laughs> There's a very striking resemblance there. <laughs> Thank you all for remembering us on this Minister's Appreciation Sunday. No doubt Sally, Marcy, and I are grateful for the support that you give us not only on this special Sunday during the church year, but also for your affirmation, your love, your prayers, your encouragement each day, each week that we do ministry together because, yes, we may be the ministerial staff, the, the leadership staff, if you will, of the congregation, but it definitely takes all of us working together as the people of God to do and to be what Little Rock Church is intended to be for Lucama and points beyond. So thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your commitment to the Lord and for your support of each and every one of us. And I have to say that this year has been a very challenging year, um, but uh, a lot of the, the organizing of efforts and all um, I couldn't have done without a lot of other people um, a lot of other people have put a lot of hours into it as well. Um, I had the, the ideas, and, and other people came on board and, and worked harder than I have in some, some aspects. Um, so um, this has definitely been a, a team effort um, to keep things going this year in our church. Um, so we may be the, the leaders of the flock but the flock have been the ministers as well. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. Romans 8, 28 through 39. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. When... What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ, will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be unto God. God. What wonderful words of assurance as we go into this season of prayer, being mindful that God is for us and with us through all seasons, all circumstances of life. As we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer this morning, I draw your attention to the back portion of the program. You'll see many who are part of our church family listed there at the bottom of the page, and no doubt we have many in the community beyond the Little Rock Church family who continue to have need of prayer. We wish to lift up Billy Watson as he was able to transition to Wilson Pines on Friday to begin his time of rehab. They were able to address some of the complications that he was having at Duke following the 
surgery. It's hard to believe that tomorrow will be four weeks since he had that surgery. So you can imagine all that he was going through during his hospitalization, but we are glad that he is improving and in good spirits. We also want to remember uh, Phil Caps as he had a little procedure this past week, and he's doing well following that. And we need to lift up Rick and Dolly Parker as Rescue picked up Rick on Friday evening, and he has now been hospitalized once again with pneumonia. He was dealing with that about three weeks ago, and that seems to have flared up again this past week. Are there other names, other needs that you would have us to lift up in prayer this morning? Miss Ann? Carol Coleman. Carol Coleman. Allie? My brother, Patrick Stilley. Patrick Stilley. Dee? Frank Harrison, former pastor. Perhaps by uplifted hand. God sees each and every heart. God understands the depths of our needs. Would you bow with me for a time of prayer? What can separate us from the love that you express toward us through Christ? Sickness, unemployment, death, broken family issues, financial instability, politics, Lord, so many of the things that frazzle us, that shake us to the core, things that make us anxious in this day and time, by no means can separate us from your care, your goodness, your provision. There are times in life when we feel alone and empty. We wonder, can anyone really identify with us? Can anyone possibly connect with the pain and the hurt on the inside? And although family and friends may leave us, they may disappoint us, we know that we lean upon you. And as I think about a song that was on our CD player driving in this morning, you are the rock that we can stand on. We may be going through some difficult times in 2020. Lord, it's been stressful. It's been a period of high anxiety, but Lord, you have been faithful. And we lean upon this faithfulness to see us through the journey ahead. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your love, your mercies, which are new each and every morning according to your word. While we do not know from moment to moment what we may encounter, we do have the stability and the consistency of your power and your presence in our lives. Lord, today it is with that that we can confidently come into your presence with new needs that are ever close to our hearts. We think of those who have been mentioned verbally, those on this prayer list who are an active part of this church community, those who are an extended part of our church family. You understand the hurts, the concerns, the challenges. And Lord, we ask that you would draw alongside and provide peace, hope, comfort, and restoration wherever the needs may exist at this very moment. God, we thank you for being the great physician, for being creator, Lord, and sustainer of all things, for being Prince of Peace, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, no matter what we're encountering. Lord, hear us as we pray. Give us the courage we need to let go of these needs, these concerns, to place them gently before your throne of grace and to allow you to be God in those situations. Lord, ease our worries. Clarify our confusion. Help us through our frustrations. 
And Lord, remind us each and every day in the journey ahead that we are not alone. We face this journey with you. Father, we love you. We praise you for your goodness and for hearing us as we pray. This prayer we lift up in your Son's most precious and holy name, Christ our Lord. Our sermon text for today is taken from the book of Jonah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Jonah, 
chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, as we continue in this series of sermons I've entitled U-Turn, and as I kind of set the stage for it last Sunday, we all go through those moments in life where by choices of our own or maybe some mishap that we were not expecting, we get turned around. Unfortunately, there are a lot of those turns that we take intentionally, and not just literally when we're traveling in traffic, but there are times when God is dealing with us, wrestling with us about something that we feel as though we know better than God, and that seems to have been the case in Jonah chapter 1, when Jonah, hearing a call from the Lord to go to that evil place known as Nineveh to proclaim God's word of judgment only to go in the opposite direction. Rather than going some 500 miles to the northeast to Nineveh, he would rather board a ship headed toward Tarshish, some 25 miles due west of Joppa. But that sounds just like us, doesn't it? We don't always like everything that God has for us. We don't always like to go to those places that just, well, they don't fit our style. They don't fit our preferences. We would prefer for God to send someone else into those ministry situations because, well, maybe we're just apathetic and indifferent. We don't care. Maybe we have a vendetta, we have some hard feelings, some issues with that individual or that group of people. One thing that we know is we can try to run. We can try to hide from God, get as far away from God as possible, but then we realize that even at our farthest places, Even when we find our ideal hiding place, essentially the Lord says, ready or not, here I come. Just like that game of hide and seek that we play as children, just as that little game that Kelsey and I will play a lot of times at nighttime. She'll always want to play it before bath time or bedtime. Can we play just a a round or two of hide and go seek? And I'm always quick to find her, although I kind of drag things out a little bit because she'll yell out, okay, come find me. And it's like, well, this is obvious. She's under the bed or she's in the closet or behind the bathroom door or whatever the case may be. I know where she is, but I kind of allow her to continue to enjoy the moment and sometimes I'll go right where she is and I'll just intentionally well she can't be there and no she can't be over there and I'll go to another part of the house and then work my way back around and she'll start giggling and so forth but it's inevitable I'm going to find Kelsey and the same can be said in our lives even though we try to give up on God God never ever gives up on us And that's a great word of assurance. That's a great blessing, especially in this day and time in which we're living with all of this political uncertainty, all of the different tensions that we hear about in the news, all of the COVID-19 that we've been dealing with for seven months or so. It has been a hard year. And sometimes when we go through those really hard and challenging places in life, the last thing that we want is a word from God. Because we want to be angry with God. We want to be frustrated with God. We want to shake our fist at God and blame God for putting us into that predicament. But we know in reality that's not how our God works. God may allow things in our lives, things that we don't enjoy, things that aren't necessarily fair. But in spite of allowing those things, God longs to be with us through those low places. Now, I've never been in the belly of a great fish. I've never been sinking down, down, down in the Mediterranean Sea. But I can tell you there have been some low places. And I know that's true for each and every one of you who are here today. 
It's true for every person that walks in the door of a sanctuary with a happy face and church clothes, ready to praise God and worship. It's true for all of us because we all are going to face those times of darkness, difficulty, or as today's sermon title says, desperation. If you've never ever been in the depths, then consider yourself lucky, but you're probably fooling yourself. We're all going to face that. It's not a matter of if, but when, and sometimes it's one thing added to another to another to just really compound things that much more. And so my question is this day is, how do we respond? What do we do when we're desperate in the depths of life? May we give ear to the reading of God's Word. It's found in Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. May we give ear to the reading of Scripture. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me deep into the sea, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The the waters have closed in over me, the deep surrounding me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars are closed upon me forever, yet you brought me up. You brought up my life from the pit, O Lord God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon dry land. Brothers and sisters, may God add a blessing to this, the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the living of these words for these days. Amen. What would you have done? You've already decided that you don't like what God has asked you to do. You've tried to run away from God. You're so low in life, you're to the point, look, I just want to be done with this mission, so go ahead and throw me overboard. I would rather drown at sea than do what God has asked of me. I don't know that we really would have been all that much different from the prophet Jonah, Because as I established last Sunday, we all experience a calling that is unique from person to person, from scenario to scenario. There is no one-size-fits-all calling of God. And there's also no such thing as an ideal, perfect, neat, and clean calling of God because a lot of times we give God stipulations. We say, God, I will go, I will do if you will do X, Y, and Z. If you will custom tailor this calling to what I really desire, what's most comfortable for me in life. But the reality is... It's not that simple. God's calling will challenge us at some point in time. And it was such a challenging time for Jonah that Jonah was ready to give up. Not only had he been rebellious toward God and disobedient toward God, going in the opposite direction, but he was at a place in time, even after he had been scooped up by this great fish, we often call it a whale, we don't know, the text just tells us a large fish was provided by the Lord. 
I don't know about you in that moment, but I probably would not have a whole lot to say in the belly of a great fish. Maybe I would just wallow in my self-pity all that more. Maybe I would just think to myself, well, this is totally disgusting. Can things possibly get worse? We all do wonder those things in life. When we go through the low seasons, we wonder, first of all, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? Where is God in the midst of all of this, and what is God up to? Because there are times when we go through those places in life that we just don't see, we don't feel, we don't hear anything from God, and so we presume that God maybe has just given up on us. Maybe God has lost hope in us, and now we have been forgotten by God. But that's simply not the reality of who our God is. But there's one thing that we can begin by looking at is the fact that it is normal to have times where we feel separated from God. It is perfectly natural in life to have those seasons where you just don't feel quite as close to God as you would like to be. Now, we can say a couple of things here. One, we can look at Jonah's experience. Jonah didn't help his situation. Jonah was disobedient to God. Jonah did some things to impact his relationship with God. And so, yes, there can be things that we do in life when we know we ought to do different, we ought to do better, but we choose to rebel against God because we think our better, our way is better than God's way. And what we end up in is a predicament similar to Jonah. We can't blame our spouse, we can't blame our neighbors, we can't blame our extended family, our co-workers, we can't blame God, we did it to ourselves. But more times than not, these low seasons in life happen in ways that we just don't understand. We feel like another individual in the scripture, Job. Job was a righteous man. He feared the Lord. He would not curse the name of God and die. He was trying to figure out, where did I go wrong? What did I do? And even as his wife tried to get him to doubt God, even as his friends tried to stir his thinking, surely you've sinned, surely you've done something wrong. God has got to be punishing you in this moment. Job could not come up with anything. And that's a reality in our world today that some of the best people we know will suffer at times. They'll receive that diagnosis that's not so favorable. They'll go through those hospitalizations. They'll go through that pain, that excruciating experience. And you're thinking, why in the world does this individual have to go through this? Why him or why her? We can think of many, many other people that are quote-unquote more deserving of that in life. But the truth is, there are no easy answers. It is inevitable regardless of how strong we are in our faith, how young we are in our faith, we're going to face those times where we feel separated. I remember early on in life thinking that there had to be something wrong with me if I didn't feel God's presence. I was always one to think that bad things happen because maybe you've been bad, you've done bad, you've hurt someone else. But that's not the case. We may go through some things that we put ourselves into, but more times than not, we're going to go through some things that we do not put ourselves into. 
And when we find ourselves in those moments, we need not beat ourselves down, kick ourselves, beat that other person down, because even though it does not make sense to our human minds, things happen. And even though things happen, God continues to abide with us when those moments happen. That was a great assurance of the epistle lesson from Romans chapter 8. I deviated from the lectionary a little bit, but I thought that was a very fitting passage because it gives us a New Testament example of wrestling with those times in life. Where is God? Is God still with us? Does God still show concern for us when we're going through those desperate moments? Yes, we will face those times where we feel separate from God. But number two, we discover quickly that even when we are at our lowest, God continues to hear our prayers. Even though Jonah had been a rebellious prophet, even though he tried to do the exact opposite of what God had called him to do, Even there in the belly of a great fish, down in the sea, he was able to put together some kind of strength to at least try a prayer for what it's worth. Have you ever felt like that? You don't know what to say. You really don't know how to pray, but you're like, Lord, it's not going to be eloquent. Lord, it's not going to be the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. Lord, I don't even really know how to pray in these circumstances, but Lord, I'm just going to cry out to you the only thing that comes to my heart and my mind. I believe that was the moment that Jonah was experiencing right then and there. Yes, it comes across to us many, many years removed from when it was penned as something that's eloquent, a a psalm of thanksgiving mixed with a little bit of lament. But let's be honest, how many of our prayers really come across that fluid? How many of them are that smooth and they just rattle off of our tongues? When you're in those low places, all you can do is cry out to God. And the beauty of this is the fact that God heard from Jonah where he was in that physical location. But he heard from Jonah where Jonah was spiritually. He knew, and we discover from reading chapter 1, that all Jonah wanted to do was be as far away from God as humanly possible. And even though we know that's foolish to even think that way, that's exactly what Jonah was experiencing in that moment. And here we start to see what we hope is a little bit of a transformation for Jonah as we know the rest of the story, but we can't get too far ahead of ourselves. In this moment of distress, right where he was, he cried out to God, and God listened. No matter where you or I may be this morning, God can still listen. It doesn't have to be in this sanctuary at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. It does not have to be at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning during Bible study. It does not have to be during a special quiet time when you're having devotions at home. It can be down in the dirty, muddy, nasty parts of life. When you're literally like this young lady in the picture, you're laying out, God, I am so broken. I am so at my wit's end. I don't know where to go, where to turn. Up is down, right is left. Everything is wrong, it seems like. God, just have mercy upon me. In this prayer of thanksgiving, and as I said, a little bit of lament mixed into it, we find Jonah pouring his heart and his soul out before God, giving an honest image of how Jonah interpreted his circumstances. Now, to read this, you're thinking, wow, this is a little bit different Jonah than what we saw in chapter 1, and a little bit different Jonah than what we're going to see at the beginning of chapter 3, because, well, 
one thing that Jonah says is that he's practically as good as dead. He's gone down to the pit, Sheol, as the word is used in the ancient Hebrew, that place where the dead would be in a holding space, if you will. Sheol would be about as low a point as anyone could have comprehended in life, and Jonah in that time felt like he was there, never to be seen or heard from again. And of course, Jonah, in some of his language here, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. The flood surrounded me. I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look upon your holy temple? The waters surrounded me. The deep overwhelmed me. But when you think about it for just a moment, isn't that exactly what Jonah wanted? Jonah wanted to be finished with God, but now Jonah is trying to turn things back toward God as if his situation is all God's problem. Wait a minute, where is the sense, where is the understanding in all of that? This is kind of what you wanted, Jonah, but now you're going to play the blame game with God. Some people would find folly, and I'll admit there is a bit of folly in that prayer. But it also reminds me that God is big enough that we can give him whatever. I'll go ahead and tell you, I've used that language before in life, and I'm a minister. There's times when I've been at my wit's end, my lowest point. I was going through some things about five years ago. And I was just about to the point, God, just just forget this whole ministry thing. Forget this calling, God. You can just go. And what I was feeling and what I was struggling with in that moment became a case of this is God's problem. God, you brought me into this. God, you're allowing this to happen. God, I don't like this. So, God, you just... And I remember there was a well-meaning Christian individual who told me, well, well, Kelly, you know, you, you especially as a minister don't need to be feeling like this toward God. And I stopped. I kind of rocked back on my heels a little bit. And my response was, according to who? Because when you look at the witness of Scripture, especially a lot of the Psalms in the Psalter itself, Those are some pretty honest prayers of lament where the psalmist was shaking his fist at God saying, God, this isn't fair. God, I don't like this. God, why, why, why? When we feel desperate, when we feel alone and forsaken in life, even then God is big enough to handle the harshness the honesty, if you will, of our prayers. To call out to God does not have to be perfect. It just needs to be honest. It needs to be real. I believe that's the quality of prayer that God hears and God honors, not that, oh, everything's great, God, in my life, and we're just going to pretend like everything's great, and we're just going to go through the motions of everything being good. If I'm hurting, if you all are hurting, whatever the background to those circumstances may be, know that God can hear those prayers. When you're in the pit, when you're in the belly of the fish, and even when you're to the point that you're just frustrated with God, even then and there, God can hear your cries. The third thing that I would say about this text this morning is the fact that God's salvation comes in unexpected ways. God's salvation can come to us in ways that we cannot possibly fathom. It may not happen according to our timetable, our preferences, our wishes, the way we would have designed some kind of a bailout plan. But when we're going through the dark times, when we're desperate in the depths of life, God does see. 
God does hear His children. God does understand where we are and what we are feeling. And He may surprise us in how He responds to our prayers. We find in the text that as that prayer came to a conclusion, the Lord spoke to the great fish and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. Now in this story, we often think about that great fish, that whale, as being an instrument of God's judgment. I believe that it did get Jonah's attention, but it wasn't necessarily an instrument of judgment. What was it? When you read the entirety of the story and you put the pieces together, this great fish was an instrument of God's salvation. Jonah didn't get swallowed by the fish because he was disobedient, but rather than allowing him to die by drowning in the sea, God had provided the fish to swallow him up, and now this fish has transported him back to the seashore and has puked him up. And even though that sounds so disgusting to us, we find a turning point in the story. It's not ideal. It's gross. But it was a vehicle of God's salvation for Jonah. How will God work in your life? I don't know. I can only speak from my own personal experiences. But those personal experiences are in hindsight. Because when I found myself in a really low place right then and there, I could not possibly put together any concept of what God was going to do to improve things. I could not imagine God getting me out of that personal hell that I was experiencing. But I'll tell you this much, God did. God helped me out of that low place, and because God did help me out of that low place, I'm able to stand before you all this morning. I didn't get swallowed by a great fish, I didn't get puked up onto the seashore, but you know what, it felt pretty close to it. God hears the prayers of His children no matter what the circumstances may be. No matter how desperate they may be. No matter how broken they may be. No matter how ineloquent they may be. God comes through in the desperate times. What great assurance that even when we try to give up on God, God still looks down on us. Thanks be unto God. Amen and amen. Today our hymn of invitation and commitment is Because He Lives, number 213. One that's very near and dear to our Christian faith, closely connected with the Easter season. Because Christ lives, because of the resurrection, we have hope. We have a new outlook on life. We have a new perspective on things. It does not mean that everything is going to be grand and perfect in our lives, but because Christ has been there, He has lived, He gave His life sacrificially, He came through death and the grave. He understands us fully. No matter where you are this morning, no matter what your struggles may be, He's willing to hear you. He's willing to draw alongside no matter how low you feel you've gone. Maybe you feel as though you've gone too far in life. This altar is open for prayer. If you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, will you come? Regardless of who you are, regardless of what your background may be trying to tell you, Maybe you're a little bit like Jonah, where you've had that close-knit relationship with God, but because of life and various circumstances, you've brought some separation to that relationship. 
Maybe you have needs, burdens that are pressing on your hearts and minds, or even thanksgivings that you would like to celebrate with your Heavenly Father. No matter the need, no matter the condition of the human heart, this altar is open as we stand to sing together, Because He Lives. truth in those hymns of the Easter season, reminding us the difference that Christ makes because he arose from the grave. That was true 2,000 years ago, and it's still just as important in the year 2020 with all of the chaos and confusion unfolding around us. It's been good to be with you together today, brothers and sisters in Christ. May God bless you and keep you as you go forth from this place of worship and back into the mission field where you will be Christ's hands and feet in the days to come. Would you bow to receive our benediction? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. Lord, we thank you for the story of Jonah. The fact that rebelliousness does not have to have the final say. And Lord, even when we're at our wit's end and lowest place in life, even then and there you hear the cries of your children. Lord, whatever needs may be close to my sisters and brothers as they leave this place of worship and go back out into the world, remind them, Lord, 
that they are not alone, that you have not forsaken them, and that you will not quit on them for one moment. Father, we ask that you would bless also these tithes and offerings that we receive, that they might be multiplied for the ongoing work of your kingdom here at Little Rock and through Lucama. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace.